This is a small and secretive group of warriors. They have no interest in glory. They take on impossible odds. Their sole object, to get the job done using any means. Special forces? No. Hollywood heroes? No. These are the ninja. They are mercenaries, assassins, infiltrators, spies, and guerrilla fighters. Their past is shrouded in mystery. Their techniques have only recently been revealed. This time on conquest, weapons of the ninja. Question. What is a ninja? I heard they didn't really exist. A kind of samurai warrior? A type of a motorcycle? All wrong, but they'd be very pleased to hear that. They were intensely secretive. They relied on fear and rumor about their methods and techniques. But they did exist. Maybe they still do. We're going to show you some of the vast range of their weapons and teach you how to use them. And for your final challenge, you will make a ninja raid. Now, you all have martial arts experience, so you won't be surprised to hear that the first level of training is always spiritual. So, I suggest you use meditation and concentration to prepare yourselves for what is about to happen to you. The origins of the ninja are disputed, being variously placed between 500 BC and the 6th century AD. Much of their knowledge may be traced to Chinese expatriates, warriors, scholars, and monks who took refuge in Japan, bringing with them the skills of China, India, and Tibet. The cultural ancestors of the ninja lived as warrior mystics in the mountains of south-central Japan, far from the increasingly structured and controlled society of the capital cities. So the ninja developed as a secret, illegal counterculture to the ruling samurai elite. Hence the deliberate concealment of their origins and the extreme secrecy of their techniques. Ninjas live in a world of lies, subterfuge and illusion. So it's essential that they have their own concept of reality. This requires great philosophical and spiritual strength and an understanding of practical psychology, which helps with the mastery of certain techniques including hypnosis, mind control, the ability to slow the heartbeat, and to keep still for hours on end. Now, these were warrior philosophers, and what may seem mystical to us was to them entirely practical. And you can't get much more practical than this. The next level of training is more physical. For this, our team members have come to a dojo, a training room. Thank you, Mark. Team, we brought you here to work with Mark Grove, an expert in ninjutsu, the ninja fighting art. He'll be teaching you how to use various weapons, starting with your own bodies. I hope you guys are ready for this. Mark teaches our team some basic skills of taijutsu, or ninja unarmed combat. These are similar to those of many martial arts. They include postures for defense and attack, rolling, leaping, and tumbling, striking and kicking, grappling and choking. Now what you see is there's a lift here. Let me, let me bring you forward. If I punch forward and I hit you like this, you see how it jolts my shoulder. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to act like I'm drawing a gun from my hip and I come underneath. You see this? So I scoot myself down and I drive it upward. Okay? So rather than stepping forward down a, a line, easy for you to block. Okay? I come here and I come up this way. Okay? This hand is going to be here for defense. Pretty simple. For many martial artists, unarmed combat is what it's all about. For the ninja, it was just a means to an end. They had to be super fit and ready for combat in any situation, with or without weapons. This is just the start. We'll be returning to work with Mark later. Right, let's look at clothing. Now, the ninja had no uniform, and you're already wearing the basic black clothes that would be suitable for most operations, including those split-toe boots there, very good for climbing and for silent movement. On your hands, you'd wear these strange half gloves. Now, these were designed to hide the intentions of the wearer while not obstructing his grip. On the head, some kind of mask. And finally, a hood. Right, here are some of your basic weapons. The next level of training is Ninja Ken with this short sword. I thought the samurai had longer swords. Right, let's get this straight. 
The ninja is everything, the samurai is not. The samurai was expected to fight openly, according to the strict rules of honor and behavior of his high social class. He would never do anything disreputable, and he despised those who did. He also expected absolute obedience, which the ninja never gave him. Let's just look at the difference in weapons. Samurai weapons are beautifully made, elegant, sacred, reflecting the spirit of the samurai himself. Ninja weapons are just tools. They're entirely practical, often hidden or disguised. They serve multiple purposes for escape, survival, or for killing. They are undecorated, cheaply made, and had no spiritual significance whatever. The ninja sword had a short, straight blade, single-edged, with a razor-sharp point. Fighting with this weapon was at close quarters and at lightning speed. Ninja weapons required many of the same techniques as the unarmed combat, now applied to the blade. The power for each stroke does not come from the arms or wrists alone, but from the whole body, slamming through the opponent, not just striking at him. This is not fencing. Each move is designed as a totally committed killer blow. If they are incorrectly executed or skillfully avoided, they can result in the ninja being exposed to a fatal counterattack. The ninja relied on the surprise hit. Hard, fast, and final. Another skill was Yai Jutsu, the fast draw technique. Now, in a violent society, a fight could break out at a moment's notice. Now, the fast draw and immediate strike technique was also practiced by the samurai. But the ninja had an advantage with their shorter sword, which could also be drawn from a concealed position. Here. Now, the sword was actually kept in a scabbard called the sagayo. Dan, would you draw your sword and come on guard against me, please? The sagayo is designed so that it can hold blinding powders, even explosives. Yeah, you caught me by surprise. There is no such thing as surprise for the ninja. Remember, these are practical tools. The scabbard also has this cord, which can be used to bind your enemies or as a tripwire. The sword itself can be used to pry open doors and windows. And this part, the tsuba, can also be used as a step to help you climb. And when you're finished, you use the cord to pull the sword up after you. Most ninja weapons are multi-purpose. The next level of training is Bojutsu. Some of our team already have some knowledge of staff fighting. The bow is a long staff of about six feet. The handbow is a half staff or cane of three feet. Staves were carried by civilians as walking sticks, but in the hands of the ninja, they could be deadly weapons. <laughs> Staves and clubs are very useful for the ninja because they can be hollowed out to conceal arrows, hooks, chains, poisons, and knives. This one is a hollowed out piece of bamboo. This can be used as a breathing aid for hiding or swimming underwater. And here is a rather nice flute, except inside the flute there is a dart. And of course, with the flute, you're going to need a sheet of music. So you place the dart inside the sheet, and you roll it up tight. Place the paper inside the flute, which closes the holes. Place the dart inside, and you have a blowgun. Fighting with stick and staff is the basis of the technique for fighting with a whole range of bladed pole arms. guys, gather around. You've learned some basic weapons and techniques, but what do you use them for? The tasks of the ninja, who can be male or female, divide into three. One, espionage, infiltration, gathering intelligence. Two, covert operations, sabotage, subversion, arson, assassination. Three, combat, either direct or ambush. But the emphasis is not on combat. It's on survival and success, using any means. Tactically, poison is better than combat. Assassination is better than confrontation. Just get the job done. Up to now, you've been using the standard weaponry, but the ninjas also had some extraordinary weapons which were unique to their own kind. 
Coming up. Our team learns that some crazy looking weapons can have some powerful results. Our team is learning some of the whole range of specialist weapons, which gave the ninja their fearsome reputation. Perhaps the most famous of these is the shuriken, the throwing star. Shuriken means blade behind the hand, and it can refer to any thrown blade. But the best known are these throwing stars. They come in many different shapes and sizes. They can be concealed in pouches all over the body. Now, these are diversionary weapons. Whatever you see in the movies, these are very unlikely to be fatal. You throw them at a pursuing enemy to slow him down, or you throw them directly before your main attack with your primary weapon. Now, there are many ways of throwing. There's the underhand way. Now, this is easy to conceal, but it's a weak throw. There's the sideways throw. Best for tracking moving targets. Throw like a frisbee. Then you have the overhand throw. Much more powerful. And finally, the reverse throw. Which, if you can get it right, it's the most difficult throw. Certainly the strongest. Now, there are also throwing spikes. Now, these can also be concealed anywhere around the body. And they can be thrown in pairs. That way, at least one of them is likely to hit and stick. You can also place a throwing spike inside the hilt of your sword so that you can throw it directly before engaging the enemy. If I saw one of these coming at me in the heat of battle, I'd have to drop what I was doing and cover myself. I can see why they're so effective. Throwing shurikens remind me of throwing knives or daggers, except there's no bulky handle to get in the way. A karma was originally an agricultural implement, but in skilled hands it can be a fearsome and versatile weapon. This is the Kusari Fundo, a chain weighted at both ends. It's simple, easy to conceal, and in the hands of an expert, almost invisible in action. This is the two weapons combined, a sickle with a chain attached, the Kusari Gama. Now this is an unusual weapon, and many opponents would have no idea what this thing is capable of. is having trouble working out how to use these weapons, and no wonder. Ninja were usually born into their profession. Their techniques were handed down from father to son, and were considered so secret that no capture was acceptable. Rather than surrender and reveal their secrets, wounded ninja committed suicide or were killed by their own colleagues. I used the chain, and uh, it's like it's alive. It just kept hitting me. I kept getting it tied up into my arms. Very difficult weapon to master. I use the short rope. I found it to be really difficult to actually tie people up under pressure and be able to disarm them. I had a lot of problems with the comma. Uh, it's a very awkward weapon to me. It's working in two different directions at the same time. The comma and chain um, weapon is very awkward. I've never used one before. I found it very difficult. Very difficult. A lot of fun, but very difficult. I think if you um, get to master it, it'd be very, very effective. So we've looked at just a few of the weapons available, but there were many other areas of training involving poisons, explosives, fire, mirrors, horse riding, swimming. Because they were so often used as spies, they learned disguise and impersonation, strategy, geography, even meteorology. They would infiltrate, make an informed assessment, and then return to advise their client of how best to attack the enemy, in what area, with what force, even in what conditions of weather. Now, there's no way you're going to learn all that, but there are two things that you must learn. Climbing and walking. Walking? Ninja have special methods of physical movement. Some allowed rapid travel across the ridge of a roof. Some were used for stealthy and swift attack. Some when absolute silence was essential. <laughs> now, there was a whole level of training devoted to methods of entry, concealment, and escape. Climbing was essential. They had many tools to help them do it, 
including this grappling hook, often improvised out of three or four karmas bound together. So, gentlemen, I want you to climb this tree and disappear. The nin of ninja is a Japanese word meaning endurance and perseverance. It also means stealth and concealment. The ideogram is composed of the two ideograms for blood and heart. The techniques of the ninja, called ninjutsu, were extremely varied. Even the ability to hide and to keep absolutely still requires constant training, both mental and physical. Coming up, the team has been taught the tools of the trade. Now it's time to use them. It's time for the team to put its new skills into action. All right, guys, you're as ready as you're ever going to be. This is the plan of a compound. Inside the compound, there is a house and a pool. In that house, right here, there is a room. On the table in that room is a book. I want you to get me that book. Now, we have surrounded the whole place with guards. If they spot you, you'll have to fight them. Just get me that book. Choose your weapons, prepare yourselves. Despite their aura of mysticism and reputation for existing on a separate plane, ninja were available to the highest bidder. They gained their notoriety as special forces mercenaries during the 15th century, when Japan was divided between feuding warlords. When peace was finally restored, ninjas were hired as bodyguards, assassins, even secret police. This kind of job would be their bread and butter. This is the compound our team must infiltrate. Guards patrol all sides of the building, so the team must use cunning and stealth to gain entry. Our team members gather on a nearby hilltop and devise a plan for breaking into the compound. Phil sneaks onto the roof. His target, the guard watching the side entrance. Dan creeps in through the backyard and carefully makes his way around the swimming pool. He'll attack a guard with his blowgun, but he wants a closer shot. Meanwhile, Lee keeps watch on the front of the house. Dan uses his blowgun as an underwater breathing tube moving in for a better shot. He prepares a poison dart and fires. Taking his man down. Phil also gets ready to attack. The guard draws a knife, but Phil turns the tables and kills the guard with his own weapon. All clear at the side entrance. Phil signals Chris to enter the compound. Chris immediately finds what he's looking for. There's the book on the table. Meanwhile, Dan approaches the rear entrance and sees a guard heading straight for Chris. Chris uses a chokehold snaps the guard's neck and heads out with the book. Out front, Lee wonders what's taking so long and heads for the front door. Chris exits with the book but sees two approaching guards and flees. Phil tosses a shuriken and gets ready for battle. Phil kills one guard, but the other one slices through his chest. Our first team member is down. Dan sees someone approaching. It's Chris, and they run off around the house. Lee doesn't see his teammates anywhere and starts to get worried, just as Dan and Chris arrive with the book. But they're soon followed by a pursuing guard. Two more guards appear. Chris takes the first one. Dan fights the second. 
Chris uses his karma and slices his opponent. Lee avoids a swipe to the head, but takes a fatal blow to the gut. Dan attacks with a vengeance. The last guard goes down, and Chris and Dan disappear into the darkness. Well done, team. And what does the book reveal? The way of the ninja is the way of enduring, surviving, winning. The ninja needs complete mastery of his skills, the ability to react effectively in any situation, and the absolute will to win at all costs. This is what our team has found out, as we have learned how to win with the weapons of the ninja. There is one weapon that has always been considered vital. To the Stone Age caveman and to the modern Special Forces commando. A lethal and gruesome killing tool that is most effective when you can look into your enemy's eye. This time on Conquest, how to win with knives and daggers. All right, guys, gather around. The knife, the oldest bladed weapon, and it's still the most savage. In the hands of a trained man, this is as lethal as a gun or grenade, and it's a whole lot quieter. It requires a unique combination of skill and guts to use it in combat. With most weapons, you can fight at a distance, but with the knife, it's close. It's this close, and it's this personal. And the question that you and all of you have to answer is, are you willing to learn to fight at this level of intensity? I'll give it a try. All right. We're going to teach you how to win with knives and daggers. And when you've completed your training, you will fight each other. And we will see who will win, who will live, and who will die. Knives have been around for as long as man has been using tools. The first Stone Age knives were made of either flint or obsidian. And they were made very simply by chipping off pieces until a sharp blade was formed. And these simple blades were absolutely essential to Stone Age man's survival. To the caveman, the knife was an all-purpose tool, not just a weapon. Its sharp blade was crucial on the hunt, both for killing prey and for scraping out the hide afterwards. Knives were also used in food preparation. Some things don't change in half a million years. One thing that did change was the composition of the knife. Stone blades can be made really sharp and quite long. But the longer they are, the more brittle they are, and the less stress they can take. Every stone blade will break. So the search was on for something that could be made as sharp as flint or obsidian blades, but last a lot longer. And that something was metal. First, daggers were made of copper, which occurs naturally in ingots like this. And then, much better, knives and daggers were made of bronze. The use of metals such as bronze and iron to make knives was truly revolutionary. Suddenly, they were easy to manufacture and available everywhere. These deadly weapons were no longer the province of the privileged few. What is the difference between a knife and a dagger? Well, the knife usually has just one single-edged blade, and it's mainly used for cutting or chopping. The dagger is mainly used for thrusting. It may have two sharp edges, but the main point of this weapon is the point. So, You've got a knife for cutting and a dagger for mainly thrusting. Which was the most popular? Well, that depended on the historical period and what the warrior wanted to achieve with his particular weapon. One of the most popular weapons of all time is this. It's called a sax, or in its very short version, called the scrammer sax. Now, this was a very popular weapon in what we call the Dark Ages by the Franks, the Germans, the Saxons, and especially the Vikings. It was from four inches to up to 20 inches long. Single, straight edge, quite heavy sometimes with this uh, sharp point. And it had a very particular technique, which I will uh, demonstrate to you over here. All right, Dan, would you step forward and be my target? And Dan, don't move. Now, the scrammer sax is designed for slashing and chopping. And the longer versions, about 20 inches, well, they use like a sort of heavy machete. But this can also make a really mean thrust with this acutely angled point. Ah! Now, the inexperienced knife fighter will usually use a cutting technique. Cuts are easier to make, they feel safer, you can keep your enemy at distance. Also, you can make as many wild cuts as you like and still remain on balance. Now, the thrust is much deadlier, but it requires more skill to make. You have to commit yourself far enough to make deep contact, 
but not so far that you lose your balance and can't recover in time if you miss. You're just a sitting duck waiting for his stroke. Of course, this assumes that your opponent is unarmoured. But what happens in a battle situation when your Viking or Saxon enemy is almost certain to be dressed in a coat of mail? Thank you. Now, keep still. A knife cut against mail is absolutely useless. But the Scramasax is such a heavy weapon and this point is so strong that it can actually pierce through the links of mail. Either like this, or if you have a small enough Scramasax, you can reverse it in the hand and stab downwards like so. But best of all is to avoid the mail altogether and to use what we call the up and under stroke. Ah! Aren't you pleased you kept still? The Romans had already solved the problem of armour piercing. They took a lot of weapons, developed them and improved them. This little beauty is the Pugio. It's like a miniature Roman short sword. Now this is not an all-purpose weapon. It's a specifically thrusting dagger. This beautiful shape and this strong central rib are perfectly designed to punch through the strongest fabric or male armour. Now the Pugio is a fantastic dagger. But when it comes to knives and daggers, you've got a lot of choices, and most all of them are good. For instance, take this weapon. No, this one, the classic stiletto, preferred killing tool of assassins throughout history, particularly in the 16th and 17th centuries. Can I borrow your jacket? Now, this little thing could be hidden anywhere. At the time, most gentlemen wore cloaks, hence cloak and dagger. If that's my target, I would simply hide the dagger inside the cloak, Walk up to my man, draw, stab, withdraw, hide the weapon and move on. This thing requires very little pressure to push it through the ribs to the heart or the kidneys, causing acute pain, internal bleeding and almost certain death. This kind of dagger was called a misericord and you use this against this. Well, no, not exactly. You would wait until your armoured knight was either incapacitated or knocked over and then you'd force his surrender with one of these. Or you could get a good deal of ransom. It was a great racket. Of course, if you refused, well, you would simply find a slot. This one will do. And um, finish him off. <laughs> or uh, how about up here? Is that right with you? <laughs> this is a quillen dagger. It's basically just a miniature sword, and often a knight would have his sword and dagger made to match. Now, you could use this on its own, but you'd usually see it used in a sword and dagger combination. Alternatively, you could use a real left-hand dagger. Now, these came in many styles and variations. They were designed not only to parry an incoming stroke, but also to trap the blade as it came in, and then lock it. Once it was in that position, well, you could just get on with the business in hand. <laughs> Knives and daggers aren't just sharp and pointy and deadly. As our team is about to find out, they're an important part of a balanced breakfast. <laughs> Gentlemen, please enjoy your breakfast. Uh, but not with your forks or spoons. All right, we're going old school. Knives only. Forks were not widely used until about the 1600s. Until then, everyone ate with a knife. And it didn't matter what was on your plate. Here's one of the classic questions about knife fighting. Do you use the weapon with the blade up in the overhand technique or with the blade down in the underhand style? Now, modern knife fighting is almost exclusively over the hand with the blade up. But ancient fighting techniques were almost always with a dagger and they were used underhand. Now, this doesn't make any sense at all. In this position, it's very inefficient to do parries and any kind of cut is bound to be pretty weak. But take it from me, we have many illustrations that show the weapon used in this position. And you don't have to take my word for it. This is a classic Renaissance fighting dagger. It's called the Rondel dagger. You try and use it like this. It's simply not designed for it. It is designed to be worn either here or here. And in this position, there is only one way to draw this dagger and only one way to use it. Grip, pull, stab with either one hand or two hands. It's very efficient, it's very fast, it can be repeated again and again, it goes straight to the heart or to the neck, the ideal places to kill a man. It doesn't matter if your opponent is wearing armour, either on his body or hidden underneath his coat, this will punch straight through it. It doesn't have to go in too deep. The Roman legionary manual had a saying, two inches in the right spot is fatal. Now you're going to learn this underhand fighting technique and you're going to have to find the right spot before your opponent finds the right spot on you. Next, team members lay their lives on the line. Our team has been introduced to some of the lethal tools they'll need for their challenge. 
They're learning how to fight and win with knives and daggers. All right, gentlemen, what does the word Renaissance mean to you? Renaissance fair? You know, that is very, very sad. The Renaissance was a period of great enlightenment in the arts, in the sciences, and especially in the killing arts. Here are some illustrations from a manual of the time showing classic dagger fighting techniques. You can see these guys are using uh, rondelle daggers, mainly in the underhand style. And they're using some pretty weird moves here. So, um, grab a dagger. Let's try some of these out. Now, the gentlemen of this period used a style called gripping and stabbing. And it was most ungentlemanly. The idea was not so much to try and parry the stab, but to actually block it and then to grip either the arm or the body, and then twist him into a position where he could not use his dagger, and you could use yours. So, try out some moves, but do be careful, these are seriously dangerous weapons. Some team members have used knives before. Others have little or no experience, and are eager to soak up knowledge they can use in the final challenge. <laughs> Sometimes keeping things at a stalemate is the best way to assure your survival. Many of these techniques are vicious. Fighting this close is not pretty. Some moves include locking, then breaking your opponent's arm. Our team members know they'll have to put all these skills together in their final challenge. The fight masters of the Renaissance also devised defensive techniques for the unarmed gentlemen against dagger-wielding bandits. And if you've ever run across dagger-wielding bandits, you know just how unpleasant an experience that can be. One thing we haven't done with the knife is to throw it. Now, warriors have thrown their knives since the earliest times, either to kill their enemy outright or to distract him before moving in with a primary weapon. The only essential for a throwing knife is that it should be balanced, somewhere around the middle. Aside from that, it doesn't matter what shape the blade is, something like this really heavy, nasty-looking bowie, or this modern, specially designed throwing blade. Now, you can throw a knife from the handle, but you get a much smoother release if you can throw it from the blade. The only way to become expert at this is to know your knife and practice with it again and again until you get it right. Consistency is most important. When the blade releases from the hand, it should be at exactly the same angle every time. And very smooth. And make sure that the hand follows through. Don't try and flip it. Now, once the blade leaves the hand, it will either rotate half a turn to stick in the target, or it'll rotate one and a half turns. That's half, that's one, that's one and a half. That depends on the distance you are away from your target. The further away your target is, the heavier the knife should be to hit it. And also, you want to raise your trajectory so you're actually releasing the knife slightly higher. So, next thing to do is to pick up our knives and start throwing them. Looks like the team is going to take a while to figure out their knife-throwing technique, so let's move on. Or rather, let's move back to Spain in the 1800s. The knife has always been the perfect concealed weapon. You could even fold it up and put it in your pocket. This is the navaja, and it was popular among the Spanish lower classes. They couldn't afford a sword or fancy daggers, but they could afford this rather elegant little folding knife. Well, actually, it's not so little. In fact, it's very, very long. Meanwhile, at around the same time in America, a frontier legend was introducing a blade that would become an international icon. James Bowie seems to have come up with the basic form of his knife in about 1827. Now, this was an entirely practical tool. You could use it for hunting, fighting, scalping, butchering meat, chopping wood, even digging a hole in the ground. Anything you'd need to do on the frontier. 
Now these were heavy weapons with wide blades, up to 15 inches long, single-edged with a clipped back, leading to a really sharp point. Now, the lighter and shorter versions were about 12 inches long. Classic fighting knives. This was the source of all modern knife fighting techniques. Commando forces were being trained with this weapon right up to World War II, which brings us to the knives of today. Gentlemen, we're getting down and dirty. You are going to learn some modern knife fighting techniques. But before you learn the techniques, there are certain rules. Rule number one, you do anything you can to win. Give yourself a break. Use the environment. Try and get to the higher ground. If you can throw dirt in his face, do it. If you can find another weapon, pick up a stick, throw it at him, block with it, anything. Remember, you always have two weapons. This is number one, your knife. Number two is the rest of your body. So, stamp him, kick him, knee him, elbow him, headbutt him, anything. This is deadly. This is kill or be killed. You have to do everything you can to win in this game. Remember, never get in too close except for the kill. If you're trying to fight this close, he may be the best knife fighter in the world, but it's too risky. Keep him at a distance. If you hit your man, he might have 10 seconds to live. In that 10 seconds, he's going to get you. So you get your man, then you get his weapon. Next, you cover your vital organs, your face, your heart, your kidneys. Stab at my shoulder. If you have to block, block with the outside of your arm. If you try and block him this way, he could cut your artery and you'll bleed to death. All right, good luck. The time for lessons is over. Next, the team fight each other for real. And we see who comes out alive. We've seen everything from stone knives to bronze and steel daggers. Tools and weapons used by Vikings, Romans, cavemen and cowboys. Now we're putting them in the hands of our team and turning them loose. The hour of reckoning is at hand. Now is the time to find out who's been paying attention and who's going to get cut to pieces and punched full of holes. You have learned many different techniques from many different times. You can use any or all of them. You'll be fighting in pairs. The winners will then go on to fight each other in a final bout. I'm looking for two good hits. A good hit is a strike to the head, a stab to the body, a hard cut to the body or to the knife arm. We're looking for skill here, not strength. You'll be wearing Helmets, padded jackets, safety glasses, gauntlets. You will be fighting with practice knives. Don't be fooled. These are as hard as rock. They will hurt. The first pair up will be Dan and Adrian. Get kitted up. Good luck. Is it suffice to say I'm a bit nervous? <laughs> Trying to avoid getting hit is probably the most important tactic. Gentlemen, fight! There was a hit to the head there. As Adrian attacked, Dan scored on a quick strike, barely visible to the naked eye. A perfect example of the knife's deadly speed. Nothing. Two hits. Well, mate. <laughs> Dan's quick slash to the head earns him a spot in the finals. Let's have the next pair. Yeah, I don't think I'm more experienced. I think John is more experienced than he's letting on. I've done a lot of things with swords and things like that, but the knife fighting thing has been a very new experience. John expressed an interest in going live after a few of our practice sessions together, so it should be good. John thrusts in, Chris blocks with his own knife arm and stabs home. A risky move that pays off. Chris hits to the head repeatedly and it looks like a clear win. But look at this. As Chris came in, John got a killer hit into his stomach. Neither man would survive this bout. 
but Chris wins on points. For this final bout, my judging standards are higher. I'll award half a point for glancing blows, but to earn a full point, you need a solid strike. All right, gentlemen, are you ready? I just have to use my reach advantage. My tactics are just to move in and out as quickly as I possibly can. Fight! Those strikes to the arm would draw blood, but now we're looking for killer blows. No points. Half point. Half point, half point here. In a knife fight, nobody walks away without getting hurt. Half point. You're not even, gentlemen. A slash to the face scores half a point. The contestants are tiring now. Chris takes a chance and moves in for the kill. Two half points. Chris is the Conquest knife fighting champion. With two quick cuts to the head, he eliminates Dan and takes home the title. You can tell immediately that when those solid hits come in, they, they really hurt. Well done. The most important thing we've found out is that no one should fool around with any kind of blade without training and safety precautions. Because although the style and design of knives and daggers may have evolved over the centuries, some things never change. This kind of fighting requires great skill. It's fast, it's brutal, it's savage. That's what we've discovered as we've learned how to win with some of the most vicious weapons around. Knives and daggers.